All right, episode 49. Here we go. Before we get into it, though, let's talk about who and what company is helping making this podcast possible. Today, today's episode is brought to you by Onnit. O-N-N-I-T. What is Onnit? Well, if you listen to the podcast, you've probably heard me talk about them before. But if you haven't, I like to call them a health and fitness organization. They might call themselves a health and fitness juggernaut dedicated to delivering total human optimization to athletes, thinkers, fitness gurus, entrepreneurs, if you fall into that boat. If you go to onnit.com, O-N-N-I-T dot com slash hot, you're going to land on the Cleared Hot landing page. So let's talk a little bit. Specifically, I'm getting uh, ready, training now. I'm one month out, essentially, from opening day with Dudley up in Alberta. And there will be some supplements involved on that trip. Now, people might be tired of me talking about supplements in relationship to how you structure your life, but I'm going to do it every single time. Because if you treat your body like crap, and you eat like crap, you're largely wasting your money when it comes to supplementation, right? Focus on the macro, get the rest, recovery, training, and nutrition dialed. Then you can delve into the world where the supplements are really going to help out. So as I'm getting ready for this trip, the three things I'm looking at, one is Alpha Brain, which is a nootropic. I take it not frequently because I want to make sure that it still has the impact on me when I do take it. But it definitely helps me maintain my sharpness, my clarity, and a lot with memory. All of that stuff is going to help in a hunting environment, so that's coming for sure. Uh, another thing that I am definitely going to be taking, and this is on the uh, onnit.com slash hot landing page, is the Total Primate Care, or TPC. They are a day and a night package, um, and it's got vitamins, minerals, a whole bunch of stuff in there. Instead of reading it all out, I'll just let people look at it if they want to. But that's morning and night. That's definitely going in the hunting backpack. And the last thing that I'll probably take up there, or I know for a fact, is going to be in my pack. If you go to the top under the foods tab, it's the protein bars and the protein bites. All I can say is, goddamn, those things are delicious. So those will be in the backpack as well. And that's really what I'm looking at um, right now as I'm training leading up to that and then getting ready to pack my gear out here in a couple of weeks. It's going to be a heavy component of on its supplements. So hit the macro, work your way towards the micro, make sure you're getting from your supplements uh, commensurate value to the money and time that you're putting in. So dial the macro first. And when you're ready, go to onnit.com slash odd and shop away. Be smart. Now, on to the episode. I'm I'm fired up about this one. I was really looking forward to this conversation for quite some time. And I had to look at it on a calendar for at least a good month and a half to two months and watch it slowly creep up. But again, if you listen to the podcast, you'll, real, uh, you'll realize you'll have heard me talk about that we recently moved to Montana. And last winter was our full season, our first full winter season in Montana. And of course to set the bar at a level that may never be achieved again. We got absolutely dumped on 410 inches of snow up at the resort, which we're extremely fortunate enough to be able to see from the second story of our house. I have two young boys in the house uh, who have a healthy disrespect for injury and fear. I really, it makes my stomach hurt watching them uh, j do just about anything because of how hard they go. I wonder where they get it from. But this last year, we dove in deep into the snowboarding world, and I was up there every opportunity I could get, even though my first experience on a snowboard was absolutely horrendous. In 2016, my brother-in-law threw on a video, and I'm not going to get into it too much because we talk about it on the podcast, and the video was called Deeper. I'm trying to remember because there's three videos in the trilogy, uh, but the subject of the video is the guest for today's episode. His name is Jeremy Jones. He is hands down a total badass. He is a pioneer, in my opinion, in 
not only the way that he goes after his passion and his pursuit, the way he actually executes it, the physical manifestation, but also the way he thinks about it and the way he approaches what it is that he wants to do and looking at everything that's available and seeing things for where they limit him and seeing other opportunities that you're going to have to work really hard for, but the reward may be unbelievable. Uh, he has a he has brothers uh, who created Teton Gravity Research, and they make amazing films. I actually highly recommend going on to Netflix and just put in the search bar, Teton Gravity Research. Every product I've ever seen come out of that company, it, there are, the ones I have seen are all based in the outdoors. They're visually rich. The storytelling is awesome. And they created this, this trilogy of deeper, further, and higher. And I'll put the link to those videos in the written description for this podcast. But for me, that is what piqued my interest in two, uh, 2016, before we moved, moved full-time to Montana. And it's been full speed ahead since then. And it was amazing to be able to meet and sit down and talk with the individual that really sparked that interest. So in addition to being a ridiculously accomplished snowboarder, Jeremy is also very passionate about uh, climate change and impacting uh, climate change specifically, and I'm speaking for him, so I may I may get this a little bit wrong, but specifically in terms of outcomes of election, looking for people that will vote uh, in a manner that will protect the environment going forward. And I'll be the first to say when it comes to climate change, that's a huge hole in my game and my knowledge base, as on many topics that I hear people bring up, as soon as people start screaming and yelling at each other, I I essentially tune it out, which is not the right answer because I'm missing a lot, but I'm so tired of hearing people scream at full volume and not listen whatsoever uh, that I know I've selectively missed out on a lot of this conversation. And it was his uh, discussion, or I watched a video of him on YouTube discussing climate change and then a post he made on his Instagram page that really got me interested in reaching out because the snowboarding was awesome, but then seeing somebody who was passionate about the outdoors and the impact of climate change on his ability to be passionate about his activities in the outdoors, that's all I needed to see. So reached out, was able to link up. We talk about his background and where where he started, where he is at now, and what he's doing, so I'm not going to dig into it. But like I said at the beginning, definitely fired up for this. Now the goal is to get him up to Montana and, uh, you know, maybe get him on the magic carpet. I think I could show him a few things uh, if I could get the six- and seven-year-olds out of my way on the way up and down that magic carpet. But that remains to be seen. So until then, episode 49 with Jeremy Jones. Here you go. Okay, I got the red smoke. Okay, copy. West of the smoke. I'm looking at danger close now. Come on, winner, baby. Give it to me. I need it. Get cleared hot. Copy, cleared hot. <laughs> yeah, for sure, too. The first, you, so the, the first day is uh, well, brutal. So I may have gone with uh, an atypical approach. We were in uh, Kodiak, Alaska in 97. Full ice, I think, was one of our days off. We were doing just cold weather training. We were off, it was either we were doing donuts in government vehicles or we were messing around with the snowmobiles that we had <laughs> in the back of them. And I don't remember how, I don't remember why my buddy had a snowboard and I had never been on one. I had surfed casually growing up in Santa Cruz on the side of a, on the side of a mountain, absolutely ice completely below me with hard Alpine boots on <sighs> and just strapped in immediately got turned around backwards and woke up like five minutes later. No, oh, helmet, just yeah. straight rear edge to the back <laughs> of my head. Oh. Woke up, undid the snowboard and just pushed it down the side of the hill and said, I will never, ever, <laughs> ever try snowboarding again. And in 2016, my brother-in-law came to Montana at the house I was telling you about. And we, it just nuked on us. The, I would wipe off a table outside every night and there'd be six to eight inches of powder every Oh, night. that's nice. But I wasn't skiing uh, either. I, I actually had kind of tossed away any snow sports. I had a little uh, work-related injury in 2005 with right. some nerve damage uh, in my left leg, and I couldn't handle the lateral stuff on the ski boots. But he came in one day 
and he throws on uh, a movie, and it was deeper. And I'm sitting there watching this, I'm like, okay, this is pretty interesting. Hmm. And then watching the climbs that you were doing, I'm like, all right, this guy is a psycho. I like him. <laughs> <laughs> I like where his headspace is. And the next day we went up to the resort, and I was like, all right, I'm going to try it again. So I put on a board and found the bunniest of bunny hills. It had yep. to have been maybe 30 feet long. The hardest part was this rope cable, like a tennis ball you had to hold on to. It was yep. like ripping my arms out of the socket. Yep. Got to the, the top and stood up. And that time I caught my front edge, but I was going zero miles an hour, so it was no big deal. And uh, kind of got back into it. And then shortly thereafter... I think I might have every board in your guys' quiver. Wow. <laughs> well, that's a, thank you. That's an honor. But, uh, yeah, I started with the Mountain Twin, and then I got a flagship. And then people were – and then my brother-in-law again was like, dude, check out the split boarding thing. I'm like, okay, so I need to get a solution. So we got one of those things and just uh, – I'm super scared of the backcountry because I know my knowledge base is yep. very, very, very low. But uh, it's been interesting. Um I don't have to worry about my ankle, which is nice because I feel really strapped in and I feel really stable. Oh, nice. But the learning curve was steep. Those first 72 hours were, it's not yeah. great. <laughs> well, and I, I, for sure, and getting through that is brutal, but I, it's funny, like once you start linking turns, um, you know, they call it a J curve. And once you start going up on that J curve, um, it's kind of, I find myself very envious of um, that snowboarder who's kind of like can get down a blue um, and then from you get into this for years where it's like you get better every run and yeah. to the excitement of that uh, feeling of like new, new experiences, new feelings um, that kind of easy evolution is um you know now i'm i work all year to like move the bar one little notch um where an intermediate's moving that bar every run it might be because you're at the top of the bar right it, it, <laughs> it gets uh but you know and then it comes down as we were talking um i mean with my kids and i it's like it's kind of uh cliche, but we're always like the best snowboarder on the mountain or skiers one having the most fun. And it's true. I mean, these sports are there just to like yeah. experience nature, have fun. And nothing is more sad than seeing like a bitter surfer or snowboarder at this really high level. And you're like, that guy's, uh, it's just, it's the saddest thing. And so we seek out, we'll be, we'll run into which by all, you know, many people would call a gaper or whatever and ride the lift with them. And we're like, I, that guy might be the best guy on the mountain today. <laughs> Look, that guy was so fired up. That guy is crushing it. And it has nothing to do with how he's riding down the mountain. I remember the first time blue is the lowest, right? Cause I started green, green. So that shows you my experience level yeah. of snowboarding. I remember the first time I was able to link like my toe side and heel side. I made it to the bottom without falling. I was beaming for like yeah. two days. At the age of 39, I was just like, yes! Totally. And so I went home. I forced my kids to watch all the trilogy of movies. And so, <laughs> so to put it into context, for me to get that like adrenaline, and, and I'm actually, it's funny, I'm, I've learned now to like, I've come full circle or I'm getting more out of simple snowboarding. But there was a point where... For me to feel like that level of excitement, I'd have to be on the edge of life and death, basically. And and that is kind of a dangerous um, deal to like it, that's a high standard to um, to get your kicks. And um, I call it walking on a razor blade. Yeah. Base jumping is kind of the same way. Totally. Um, like we were talking before uh, the last episode I just did with Mark, we talked a lot about kind of risk and loss and dealing right. with that and how it because for me right now I'm in a spot where I'm I'm struggling with processing what's going to be next just based yep. off of uh things that have happened recently but if you walk on a razor blade you might not even know you're bleeding sometimes and that's where it gets dangerous right. yeah and it's like you think and like some of the snowboarding I've done or base jumping would be a great example of it's like if you need to if that's like mainlining adrenaline. Um, and if that's kind of like what you need to do to feel alive, um, 
Yeah, and that's not to discredit the joy. I mean, it's fun to mainline adrenaline at that level. It's just yeah. it's a dangerous game, and and I've been um, on this this um, quest to get more out of the mundane, and um, I've become a less pickier snowboarder, a less pickier surfer, um, and I love that. I'm like, man, you know, to be able to go and get this like total joy and contentness in mundane waves or snow conditions or terrain is the evolution that i'm super proud of really it extends your uh the timeline of your life too yeah i would say it really helps you enjoy more of those moments yes which is uh, i describe to people just about everything i do i'm going for the low lowest trajectory over the longest timeline as opposed to the steepest candle that just burns out right that's Although it may be bright. Yeah. <laughs> I've never watched a YouTube video where I said, you know what? That's worth dying for. Right. Ever. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. So we have to, I'm just infinitely curious too. I want to just go back to when you started boarding because yep. like I kind of alluded to, you're at the top of the bar now in what you do. I'm sure that didn't happen overnight. So fill me in, man. How did the, how did the yeah. journey begin? So, um, Got, so basically, grew up on Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Um, my parents uh, fell in love with the mountains late, kind of late in life, or you know, kind of in their uh, mid twenties, uh, through my grandfather, who discovered Vermont. And I and I say that from on Cape Cod, we have a, what we call the bridge disease, where. Um, very few people drive off of Cape Cod like that. Um, <laughs> Reminds me of the island of Coronado in California. <laughs> yeah. So, for example, I have about 90. I come from a huge family um, with about 98 immediate aunts, uncles, first cousins. Um, oh, damn. That's 12. My mother comes from 12, um, is one of 12. My dad is one of four. They've all had kids. Um, so of those 98, it's basically my brothers um who started teton gravity research and live in jackson hole and myself and uh, you know one or two others that don't live on cape cod or within an hour from cape cod so finding vermont was like where is that uh, my grandfather so he found vermont parents visited they loved it they dragged us up there my brothers and i pretty quickly um, fell in love with just the freedom and the beauty and snow and uh, and we were just like we we need to be in the mountains full time and as soon as we could do that um, we did that and uh, and just I started out um, went to my first pro snowboard and I, I'm actually feel really lucky because when I started out snowboarding, um, there was no metal edges. There was no, uh, high backs on the bindings, super basic snowboards. Was it just a plank of wood? Basically? It was a plank of wood. <laughs> and then if you look at the timeline of snowboarding, it went from like on 80, 1983, we're on a plank of wood and by, well, 1987, it's allowed at my home mountain. So we started out where we had to hike everything to snowboard. We'd hike the resort after it was closed. Um, and so by 91, we're basically in snowboards that largely resemble what we're into today. So the super short, really like, re and it was really around like, between 87 and 1990, it was like the evolution of product was through the roof. Um, what drove that? What drove that is, um, I mean, I think people coming to snowboarding yeah. um, and then it was uh, just this, like the high back was this huge breakthrough. Um, a metal edge was this huge breakthrough. And I guess once they figured out like that the ski construction would work on snowboards, yeah. uh, coupled with a high back, coupled with being able to ride a lift. So you're like <laughs> constantly, you know, you're doing a, a year's worth of riding in yeah. one day. Um, made this really fast, you know, crazy trajectory. And then by 1998, it's in the Olympics. So virtually in 10 years, it went from like, not allowed to be in a ski area, um, hard to ride down the mountain, which you experienced, 
to really, you know, this massive sport with um, in the Olympics, right guard commercials, you know, mainstream. So to be a part of that uh, trajectory um, was, I feel, really fortunate. So you started off just recreationally and then dove head first. I mean, um, obviously it's a passion of yours, but did you find that passion pretty early? I did. It was actually my moment that you explained where you were like, I link turns and it was the greatest <laughs> thing ever. Um, it took me forever to learn how to link turns on hard snow. So, and I remember it was evening. Um, I had just gotten um, a Burton cruiser with high backs and edges. And I thought that was going to unlock snowboarding for me. It didn't. Um, I was at peak frustration and I'm like, okay, I'm, ready to like trade this board in i did it was just having a really tough go on it and then i hiked up laid it um just as it was getting dark to higher than i'd been all day and i just um let the board go faster than i'd let it go and it was almost like this like hand of god like (laughs) because we had nowhere there was no one to teach us there was no ski instructor yeah and i just put it on edge made a turn did it again did it again did it again got to the bottom i was so excited that i actually broke the binding trying to get it off (laughs) to run back up the hill and i literally like i can walk to the exact spot where i made my first toe turn and first heel turn on hard snow and at that point it took took over my life i was um Grew up really into hockey, being from Massachusetts, yeah. and everything else went away. Um, two years later, did my first uh, contest, um, did won the contest, continued to kind of win everything as an amateur. Two years later, did my first pro contest, got third in that. Um, what did the contest? What was the actual contest like? What were you guys competing in? Obviously, you were on a board, but what were you trying to accomplish? Yeah, so we there was racing and there was half pipe. There was no terrain parks at this point okay. in time. And it was really the Craig Kelly era of the best snowboarder was the one who could win a race and win a half pipe contest. And everyone did everything. And by 90 two we started getting special uh, specializing splitting between the two you mean yeah, yeah. um and at 90 right around nine, 91 92 i did my first pro contest um i started out doing everything but i was naturally a gifted racer um so it got contests were expensive to enter. It was 150 bucks to enter a half pipe contest, 150 bucks to enter a race. I went to the first pro contest, got third in the race, got like 50th in the half pipe, <laughs> um, which was to you know, I it didn't surprise me, but I'm like, not wasting 150 bucks on that. Yeah, that was more um, confirmation you were gonna. <laughs> yeah, ship. yeah. And then racing was my ticket um, to see the world and. But along the way, uh, when I grew up, my brothers were predominantly skiers. um, And it was always about riding top to bottom, nonstop, linking turns, airs, finding the little powder stashes. And that was still um, at the heart of it, what I wanted to do. And racing was a passport to get me to Europe and get me to these places. But it was always like, as soon as the contest was over, it was free riding, never took days off. Cause as soon as, you know, we'd have a day off after a race and I'd be up free riding. And so it was always a connection for me. What, uh, in those early half pipe days, what, what do you think the reaction would be if like, a current day Sean White dropped in there and just ripped one of the tricks that he was doing. Would people have just put their boards and just kicked them downhill like you win? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was a big deal. Like um, the McTwist was a huge um, scenario. And the half pipes, um, I, I mean, they were hand dug. Oh, boy. They were didn't have vert. You'd have these um, like tombstone highway hits that you'd kind of dig out. So you'd have this ditch with like like chiseled jumps along the side um but it was it just the progression that was going on uh was happening contest to contest 
It's like you're saying somebody in the beginning curve of learning how to board. There's if you're starting at zero, every day you're like, oh wow, this is possible. Yeah. Oh okay, I didn't know I could do this. So when I like I was, when my brother-in-law turned that video on, I like my mind was blown. And I I would say probably the comment that blew my mind the most. And I don't know if it was in deeper. It might have been actually I think it was. But you started talking about how the helicopter limited you yep. instead of opening up the world to you. And I think that's a diametrically opposed mindset that most people have. Because they're like, oh, I get to ride in a helicopter. I don't have right. to hike. So that it was in that moment I was like, okay, th there's something here. And I knew I knew I would appreciate your mindset. Um, and when I, <clears throat> when I left the military, I was always – was passionate about skydiving. I had no way or no, I couldn't figure out how I was going to make it into a profession though. Right. Cause loving something that's expensive is great. <laughs> as long as you have a way to fund it. Right. When did you realize that you could turn your passion into a profession? Because you, I mean the writing you were describing the contest, if somebody throws on either deeper or further or higher, they're not going to see that type of writing except right. right. Except for in a flashback. Yeah. Which is pretty cool. Yeah. So I, I guess I just say there's a huge gap between, it seems like what you used to do and you now, it seems like somewhere in between there, you figured out a way to turn your passion into what you do for a living. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, you know, like kind of when I started out, there was no team managers and it was really, um, I'd say this going from, um, kind of a groveling pro to, <laughs> um, a getting paid to make snowboard movies. Um, that was a, um, a solid six to eight years where it, I was, you know, we were sleeping in cars, um, like camped at the helipad in Alaska, um, living off of very little funds and, yeah. and like living off of cliff bars. Cause and they want to give you gear. Yeah. It's it, skydiving is the same way. It's tough to pay a mortgage with a canopy. Yeah. And so <laughs> it was this where for um, a long time it was, you know, my parents going, when are you going to college? When are you going to stop doing that? Like, this is ridiculous. You guys are, my brothers were in the same boat. And, um, and so I don't, uh, I mean, I, w I had enough money to buy my first, you know, beater car at, 20 years old um and i didn't really start making ends meet till i was probably 26 years old um and so that kind of you know and it's common i see it in life where it's like you have this passion and to get from like to make that into a full-on um career that that gauntlet that you need to run that's whether a great it's term a, for it <laughs> that's a great term yeah. for it you know there's like gravestones along the way yeah. where people are like throw in the like white flag and go man i this is just too hard and street signs that say give up now yeah and it could be a photographer like oh, almost God, yeah. every time you look at like the dream job of someone you're like god you how did you do that and it's like well i lived in my car for six years it's uh, the end state of the dream <laughs> job what they see it's yeah the, the youtube video it's like uh base jumping on youtube the video starts 15 seconds before exit usually right and almost always turns off before their feet hit the ground and you hiked for six hours right to get that 45 seconds and, but that just doesn't make the highlight real totally yeah it's uh I had the same journey. I, I knew what I loved to do and I ended up taking those offshoots with like one eye on, I'm going to do this. I'm driving down that road, but I have to do this cause I have a mortgage. Right. I have a car payment and then I would come back to it. And then, yeah, I mean, it was, it was, I remember kind of laughing to myself the first day I got a sponsor to skydive. I was just like, ha ha ha. <laughs> I fooled everyone. Yes. <laughs> Did, uh, so you started, was the kind of leap for you making snowboarding films of which I have seen almost none. Um, cause I, that was more like in the DVD VHS days. Right. Yeah. For me, um, my brother started a film company called Teton gravity research. Um, we fell in love with snowboarding in Alaska. The dream was to go to Alaska, um, for four to, 
six weeks a year and make um, snowboard movies and use helicopters to do that. And uh, I did that. I was super successful at, at it. I was, uh, I was in about 50 snowboard movies, um, which largely were based around using a helicopter, which is an incredible tool yep. to make snowboard movies with. Um, and by my last year using a helicopter, I was in five snowboard films. Um, in that four to six week season, you were able to... Yeah, I could go in and shoot a video part, which traditionally uh, a pro rider would uh, spend all year to shoot one part. I could, in three sunny days in Alaska, I could shoot a video part. So I would just, like, move through these different film companies and, and just really, and my I was, um, like, 30 years, I think 30 years old at the time, my career was cranking, sponsors were fired up, and I had this um, awesome ecosystem of uh, filmers, photographers, other riders. I had, it was just like down to clockwork. I knew, you know, I had a hotel room waiting for me at the key spots. And, you had a and, template uh, that was dialed. It was so dialed. And, but along the way, I'm like, man, that we, the progression's not there. Um, the, I felt like I was selling the wrong dream of like a dream that only 1% could do. Yeah. I mean, at that point I was spending probably $30,000 a year on helicopters. Um, and we, a helicopter, uh, the reality is you can only take a helicopter to about 5% of the world's mountains. And I've always enjoyed uh, that feeling of seeing new terrain for the first time and then figuring out, uh, fi finding that perfect line in new tr in these new mountain ranges and then figuring out how to ride them. And, um, and that's when I realized that the helicopter was limiting. Were you able, I mean, it sounds to me to be able to film a segment in three days. Are you, were you looking at the train and studying it and you just had that ability to know what you were going to be able to do? That's how you could just drop in and just rip that session. Yeah, I got um, really good at um, looking at terrain, finding my line, standing on top, knowing exactly where it was, and then also um, understanding avalanche uh, conditions and going in with a helicopter and learning how to assess snow conditions super fast. So we'd go in, drop a cornice, um, like start our day first thing. So the hard thing in Alaska, you get, it's awesome. You get a bunch of snow then you get sun and then snow and then sun. So how quickly can you go to get to movie terrain after a storm? And I figured out, um, amongst with my brothers at, at TGR, we, I mean, that we were, you know, we were committed to like, how can we get onto this kind of movie terrain as fast as possible? We figured out how to, um, We'd find a cornice to drop, which is largely what they would do at a ski area where they, um, you know, put a um, bomb on a slope to test it. And if it slides, you figure out it's dangerous. That and then this huge breakthrough was I figured out that the really fluted spines um, are actually really safe. And we could get on those really fast hmm. without by skipping a ton of steps. Um because those really steep faces, they're constantly shedding and you don't have like the most dangerous avalanche terrain is a 38 degree open bowl. Really? So a 55 degree fluted face, um, if you think of like that big open football field, that slides, that's going to kill you. You look at these fluted faces, um, they're all broken up and there's not much to... They just can't hold a lot to slide It just can't down. hold that football field of snow. Wow. When you say that you can only get to 5% of the mountains via heli, is that a limitation of the helicopter or is that because these zones, you can only take the helicopter into certain zones? So the helicopter limitation is two things. One, um, they can only go so far with fuel. Um, and so you look at like a place like Alaska, um, it's just so massive and there's so few roads. So to like kind of have your fuel supply oh, okay. um so you kind of always have to keep coming back to that road uh that and then when you get to say the um 
the lower 48 and largely most of Alaska is um, you're not allowed to take machines there. We have really protected um, wilderness. Is it a national park boundary or who's drawn those boundaries? Um, it's national park and wilderness areas. I can see that as a good or bad, depending yeah, on whether you, or not you want to make a movie on it. Well, and you can... You know, that's a, um, and I used to, my view on that has changed. Yeah. Um, when I was snowmobiling um, to make these movies and using helicopters, I would look at big protected chunks of terrain and be like, God, oh, what a shame. We can't take a helicopter in there. So what was the tipping point where you're like, you know what? We're going to go on foot. So it was a, multiple different things because it was the like one i felt like i was selling the wrong dream um because who's got that kind of money to go snowboarding so i was distancing myself from those people i was standing next to in lift line um two was i started just had this um i and and the thing is i was always i would hike all year save all my travel budget just for alaska and i really enjoyed that um that experience of hiking it's it it is always um been with me um another factor i hated uh that as i was seeing these mountains change and realizing that my footprint and and the resources and um you know what the it got harder to justify burning that much gas to go snowboarding yeah. When you say change, you're just talking about what they would look like year after year, the snow. Yeah, climbing. I was starting to really, um, you know, see climate change um, yeah. take effect on these areas that I was snowboarding. And and my snowboarding was um, was at, was part of that problem. Um, and then I really got, I started having this craving to, not want to go back to my hotel room at the end of the night. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a, um, and it was a really big turning point for me. And it was terrifying. It was actually in it. It's funny. The things that have kept me up more at night, um, is not this like serious mountain I'm going to snowboard, but these changes or decisions I've made in life. Um, so the anxiety of like, it was very funny when I, and I told my sponsors, I was very honest. I'm like, Hey, I'm making these big changes. At that point I was 30 snowboarding 30 years old is technically kind of the, you know, that's the equivalent of like 80 years old in pro snowboard years. Your like, master's category. Well, your master's <laughs> and you're kind of like, this is probably my last contract. Um, and I'm like, I'm going to do this on my own way. Um, I have this path I want to go on. All that that ecosystem of filmers and photographers and riders, none of them came along with me on that. Um, I lost some sponsors on it, uh, which I was totally comfortable with. And I figured there'd be this small group of people that liked these films. Um, but I largely figured I would... Um, was kind of out of my on the way out of being in the spotlight being in magazines and stuff so the equivalent of with a helicopter we'd film eight lines a day on foot we were lucky to put three film lines down in a month of being out there yeah and i, I don't know if people listening to this will have an appreciation for it unless they go watch some of your films you're when you say hiking or on foot right um just go yeah I'll put a link to all of them. You need to go watch <laughs> to get an understanding because there's some hiking and on some on foot stuff that'll make you sweat watching it. And the distances, it's not like you're talking a hundred yards. You're talking right. miles. Yeah. And it's, it's funny cause, um, you know, along the lines when I had started protect our winners, um, a couple of years prior to this, um, which is this foundation focused on slowing down climate change. Um, but my friend, you know, my friends and these people I've been working with, you know, kind of under their breath are like, wow, man, this, he's taking this environmental stuff really far. And they jokingly be like, how's that hippie snowboard film coming? <laughs> and, 
what they didn't realize is we're like 75 miles from the closest road camped out underneath the the biggest um mountains and lines that i had ever tried to snowboard and i was my goal was going if if i can figure out this foot powered stuff um and how to hike these things i now have 95 percent more terrain to choose from which means the best lines of my life are ahead of me if i can figure out um how to safely hike up them and and ride them i wanted to go and take that um that that same level of action and snow quality and terrain and hike them and um it took a long time it wasn't until two years in on on deeper at the end of that filming where i um undoubtedly achieved that that dream yeah again amazing film um when you were so what year was your first foot powered God, so it's probably, say, call it 10 years ago. It, um, so around 2008, I would guess. Um, and when did Jones Snowboards enter into the equation? Because you obviously you were yeah, using so other great, people's um, stuff during Yeah. That. So what happened is I felt I, like I started splitboarding a ton. Yeah. Um, and that's... How were the first splitboards? <laughs> so splitboarding had been around um, for, you know, kind of, it's arguable when, you know, for a while, at least since, you know, 87, maybe before that. Oh, really? I thought it was um, more, I had more recent. Yeah, maybe it was 90. I don't know the exact um, time, but at that time they were really heavy. The binding interface and, and for your audience, basically what a split board is, is it's a snowboard that's cut down the middle and um, it can, it turns into skis and you climb a mountain seemingly, uh, you know, on on wide cross-country skis yep. you get to the top it turns back into a snowboard you snowboard back down. it's a transformer yes <laughs> um and early on it took a long time for it to go from uphill mode to downhill mode it was heavy the bindings had a lot of slop in them um but they worked and um kind of they were starting uh actually in Montana, this, really? um, company smart spark R and D came out with a new split board binding that made it, I don't, you know, call it 10% better, but a key step, um, of, it was the first innovation that had uh, split boards had largely stayed exactly the same since they first came out. Spark came out with this, um, enhancement to the interface that yeah. just, made it feel that much more like a real snowboard. Um, but we were cutting our snowboards down the middle. I was going to ask you, I'd heard stories of people saying, yeah, basically we would just jig the thing right down the middle. <laughs> yeah. So we, and then in doing so they'd get a lot softer. <laughs> um, and so we had, I, and it became where that was predominantly, um, it was about 80% of my snowboarding at that time. And I'm on these boards cut in half and, my sponsors like we will never make a split board there's not enough market for it I started talking to other companies they were interested in having me ride for them but they're like we're not making a split board um so i decided to start jones snowboards and halfway through um filming deeper and it my first split board was called solution and it really was this missing point to where in the past we would split board up these mountains strap in and be like okay note to self you're on a split board you can't ride the same way that you could ride a normal board and then once we started putting uh, real attention into these split boards we got to a point where we were strapping in going all right these things ride just like your normal snowboard yeah one of my favorite things to do is split up the hill first thing in the morning before yeah. the lift is open potentially deviate from the course that they say to come down on because there's just a more awesome yep. course to the left board goes in the back of the car grab the flagship go hit the resort for the day and then just pray to god i don't fall asleep on the way home just completely worked at the end yeah. of the day it i have super limited experience but i have found that solution i can't tell the difference other than the bindings feel different right. because of the resort bindings i have and the 
What are they? I think that I. Pretty sure I just went to your website and got exactly what we got. Kakorum? Is that Karakorum, how you say it? Karakorum. Karakorum, yes. yes. Those are the ones I have. Those things are awesome. Yeah. So that another interface. So that kind of like sparked. Um, did one, did no, so the Spark R&D, did that kind of fire off a lot of other, because it got people thinking, right? It just got people going, yeah. oh, wait a minute. We can like put a little bit of energy into this and, and we see results. And, and now fast forward today, there's multiple different interface bindings Karakorum being one of them who i work with um there's a smaller company phantom making cool stuff um and then now it's every major snowboard company makes a split board uh which is great i mean we you know first and foremost um i'm a snowboarder that wants the best snowboard possible so i love the fact that there's multiple different binding companies snowboard companies they're competitors of mine uh but they you know they collectively we are raising the bar and then making for a better user experience which at the heart of it that's that's what i'm into. yeah that's what you're there for how has it been uh owning your own board company what you thought it would be you know owning the um snowboard company is it's funny. The two things I never wanted to do was make my own films. <laughs> <laughs> I know where this is going. <laughs> and start my own snowboard company. And in the course of 10 months, I made the decision to do both. Um, and the snowboards have been, it's been a real, uh, it's been a ton of fun, quite frankly. I mean, yeah, it's a lot of work, but to, as a snowboarder to have um, total freedom to develop what I want, and um, the best people in the world to help me develop what I want uh, and then have the, the customer um, support that and then allow me to keep developing more stuff. Um, it, it's been this great honor uh, and nothing. The ultimate compliment for me is when I see a Jones snowboard in a lift line or at a trailhead. I bet. Yeah. I see them all over up in, uh, in big mountain, yeah. usually on little kids that are passing me. So I try to catch up <laughs> and push them over in the line, which is actually what I do with my own kids. Cause <laughs> I, you know, you're talking about the learning curve. I don't understand how they pick it up so fast. I think it was a morning, maybe a morning yeah. and they're just, choo, choo, and I just yell, slow down. <laughs> don't go in the trees or go together. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's, um, I mean, it, it's funny. You said like I was skateboarding today with my kids and, uh, I was watching my son and I'm like, all right, I, I got like two weeks before he passes me up. Uh, you have to cheat is the dad technique <laughs> that I figured out the, is the only way to keep him in check. So the first year that Jones snowboards came out, was it just a split? So we came out with four models, a split board, the flagship, yep. a mountain twin, and then this alternative kind of directional powder board called a hovercraft. Which my brother-in-law is in love with. Nice. Yeah. He actually, so I have a question from him since we're on boards. In your opinion, in the last decade, the greatest technological advancement or achievement in snowboarding? I would say um, the 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 really from a shape perspective um yeah we're, we're getting better at using materials but the if you look at um say buyer's guides over the years in snowboarding ironically in 1987 you would have this diverse um shapes and then by 1992 every snowboard looked pretty much relatively the same. the same and yeah. that lasted until um god right around 2008 was the start and it was kind of also why i started um the snowboard company because the other you know the what the companies were saying is we're not investing in new shapes and we're not investing in split boards and um and and they were all 98 percent of the energy was put towards uh, snowboards for riding the terrain park and cause terrain park came along. It was this great boom for the sport. Terrain parks are awesome. Uh, but it's not the only dimension of snowboarding. And so I was friends with McConkie and along when he started doing these really radical Those fat uh, paddle skis. Yeah. I mean, reverse camber, reverse side cut, um, turned 
sh ski shapes on its head and I wanted to start bringing that into snowboards and so that led um, that was another thing that got me over the line to start Jones um, and since 2008 2010 I mean these it just continues the last five years if you look at the diversity of shapes on the market uh, it, it just really enhances the snowboard experience and what it does is it takes depending on what board you grab for that day it will take your home mountain and make it into a completely different mountain and that makes that, that mundane slope really fun yeah even just looking through the jones line like you get, to get some some of them with the i won't call it a crazy swallowtail but it yeah. can, in comparison to the rounded out you're looking at that like I don't know if I could ride that thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, if you would, so my go to powder board right now is a 147 swallowtail with full surf rocker, and it's, I think it's 28 centimeters wide. And four years ago, if you said, what are the chances on you riding a board like that on the best day of the year? I'd be like, bet my house on it. Um, oh, that's your go to on the best day of the year. Yeah, and it's just like, I would have never in a million years thought that I would have got there, but it's, I really, um, embrace this. Like I try to really have this open mind with, with product development and never, um, crush something until I've had it on my feet. And, um, because things, you know, it's weird how you, you have these great breakthroughs. Um, but if you follow the path with, got you to that breakthrough it's it's a winding road yes uh would you say a lot of your innovation comes from surfing um a lot of i'd say Could, recently I, a lot has come that we've had this pretty groundbreaking um for for myself if you look at what i'm snowboarding right now uh hooking up with the surf shaper chris christensen and going to his shaping room and going shape me a snowboard with the same tools that you by hand the same way you shape a surfboard and let's see where that takes us um was he the guy from uh, life of glide yes that well that's why i asked that question it's like you can i surfed a little bit in santa yep. cruz i never surfed a ton so i never and i've snowboarded a little bit so i can, there's no way i can make the comparison but it seemed like you can almost see in the video like your thought process just chick, 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 firing off and then the swallowtail, like a lot of uh, different designs. Well, what's interesting, a lot of different designs, and we have like that one, you know, this swallowtail that's pretty radical out there deal. But if you look at what we're developing now, we're bringing pieces of that swallowtail into um, the whole suite. The whole suite. Um, and we have some new stuff coming out that. <laughs> of i you know updating some staple products that there's some dna from uh the surf shape so that's why you know i say that that for us that we've learned some pretty critical stuff wingsuits are the same way um it's the same material largely that the first people jumped the cut and camber of the wing yep is modified and they're they're messing with materials to reduce drag and ways to make inlets higher ram air but lower drag and it's just the slow modifications but if you take an older generation suit and by that i mean four years ago right skip the generation in between and grab a new one from yep. some of these people on the cutting edge it looks the same and you put it on and you're like i feel like a fighter pilot and That's from the awesome. outside well, yeah and from the outside it's like okay yeah my arms stop here and right looks like a combination between a straight jacket and a prom dress and <laughs> but the it's all based off of feel and just the the biggest difference from the first wingsuit I jumped it felt mushy yeah and the ones I jump now you get out and as soon as the thing powers up it's just you're like oh my goodness That's and you awesome. want to yeah and then angles I mean I have some suits where I could literally just fly it vertically and you're just doing a slow corkscrew whereas the first suit that if I had done that I would have been in a flat spin head out seat like maverick without right. the ejection seat wow which is not yeah. awesome <laughs> yeah um my wife is not a fan of a term that i picked up from you called quivering because <laughs> uh, um, boxes will show up at the house and she right. just she just looks at me and she's like really <laughs> i'm like well come on I, you know I right. need, you gotta have everything for every condition but right. it's i love 
I have always been um, a gear nut. Like I would, we would get issued gear. I would go immediately take it apart and move a pocket a quarter of an inch. Right. Because I want one. I wanted to understand it. Um, I'd imagine you're the same way. And, and so there's probably no. Is there an upper limit on the evolution of snowboards? Or I mean, do you think it, in ten years are you still going to be? I mean, uh, yeah, I think that we, you know, so because we also are doing. Um, we're on a really deep dive right now on some material stuff um, that's been going on for a couple of years. And uh, so I think we'll continue. Um, we have what we call the ode to progression is um, ode to progression. <laughs> yes. And it's, um, you know, it's something like, you know, all things can be made better either through material or design. Stagnation is not an option. And so some of the stuff like use flagship, for example, that's a board that is this like really refined tool that I started developing um, at Rosignol days, uh, which was a snowboard company I worked with before um, I started my own. And I was with them for 19 years. And I think I had my own boards with them for 10 years. Um, and that, that board um that you know when it comes to like riding the most serious mountain want to go as fast as possible stomp the biggest airs um that's the board that i grab and so to make refinements to that board are these really small refinements but over time those small refinements they, they add, up. Um, add up and then um i still think with the split board stuff we'll continue to see quite a bit of progression um, so I do think that, yeah, I mean, I, you know, our plate is full. I mean, the amount of prototypes that we're doing right now, um, gotta be ungodly. Yeah. It's just a ton of stuff that we're working on right now. And some of it takes years. Some of them we implement it right away. Well, that's what I was going to ask from new idea to on a rack at a snowboard shop. I mean, is it, I'm sure it could be quick if it was simple, but for a, a brand new concept idea, you talking years? It's funny the um like these these surf shapes that we um did those happen those happen pretty quick where we got them on snow and we're like never felt that before this is amazing let's make it the flagship for example um to make an improvement on that that's years because uh, you have this really refined product with a pretty specific usage um, which is really demanding like needs to handle speed stomp cliffs handle all snow conditions that you know that's a development that we're a couple of years in on a um, developing this new flagship you get to ride them all too don't you i do get to <laughs> i am uh it, it's that's where i say the snowboard stuff like yeah it's a lot of work but god yeah. it's a dream come true it's the passion into a profession it's a, i wish more people could find a way to do that at the level that you have done it. There's a rewarding sense of accomplishment. I'm very fortunate. There's no quite, I mean, if I, now that I have some perspective, I'm looking at like when I started snowboarding, like, I mean, to the day I had like the perfect birthday to um, come up through snowboarding. And, and so I, you know, timing, passion, a little bit of luck. Um, yeah. What do you guys do in the summer, though? Like, I watched you post a video yesterday of riding an electronic bike to a piece of snow that I would have looked at and walked away. Of course, you guys climbed it with snowboards and skis. Uh, yeah. How do you test snowboards in the summer? Well, uh, Mount Hood uh, is actually pretty fun snowboarding um, on... And then depending on the year where we are with the design cycle, I will go down to Chile. And that's kind of our last chance to put final touches on um, the new line of snowboards, which, say, would come out a year later. Yeah. And so you have new stuff coming out this year? We So the stuff that's shipping right now, like, is our warehouse is full with the new product right now. Um, that stuff was, comp like, totally finished a year ago. Is it on the website now? Uh, it'll be on. We'll launch the new website August 15th. Oh, hell yes. Hopefully. <laughs> Did you hear that, web designer? <laughs> you said August 14th, so you yeah. have one extra day. That's It's so fascinating to me. The I love the innovation and evolution. Like I don't understand the aerodynamics enough on the wingsuit, but I intuitively can feel it. And it's like they'll launch a new one, and I'll sit there, and I'll – 
like, yeah, I got to buy that. I'm going to have to <laughs> feel the difference between the two. So I think it was, I think it was about a year ago, maybe less. Um, you posted a picture on Instagram coming out of the Capitol building in a suit and tie, which I assume is daily attire at Jones, <laughs> just three piece. Yeah. Um, and I had been following you before then and just loving this, uh, I love the snowboard aspect of it just because it's like, wow, there's, this is a never ending journey, but you, the post was in essence, and I'll paraphrase and probably mess it up, but it was talking about climate change. And this particular post, like I was telling you before, was probably the, it was the reason that I eventually reached out to you because the post was, you could have been writing a direct message to me. It's like, here talking about climate change. And it seemed like you were curious as to why, or why people vote the way they did. So you talk to some people right. and it's not even on their radar. Right. And that was me. I honestly, it's if, as far as educational and knowledge and holes in my game, that, that could be one of the biggest ones right there. Not that I'm a deep student of uh, government or understand that process, but I certainly know more about that than uh, anything when it comes to, to climate change. And so I saw that, I was like, all right, that's it. I'm going to sit down and talk to this dude because in the first video, when I heard you talking, I think that I think I actually heard you talking before I saw the video because he had put it on and I just could recognize the passion in your voice. And I've been kind of miles is the same way. Right. Um, other than the fact that he's obviously insane. Um, <laughs> that guy is so fired up and so passionate about folding a t-shirt, hiking a cliff. It's like he's <laughs> totally. Yeah. That glass of water is me. <laughs> yes. He's just, if you don't know Miles, I got to get him on at some point. You do. Too. Oh my God. I don't know <laughs> if I could control him is the problem. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like no Red Bulls for three days. Right. They actually calm him down sometimes, which is bizarre given what's <laughs> in it. But I love the passion. And then I started digging into it. Um, but pow, protect our winners. Yep. So, and you alluded to it a little bit. You started noticing the change in the environment. Where did the, where did the seed for pow start? And then when did you fire that sucker off? So, um, so yeah, protect our winners. Basically in about 2005, I had the idea, um, and I had the idea cause just to back up, um, you know, the, the type of snowboarding that I do is requires me to have a very, um, it's almost like we go into the mountains. It's this intimate conversation with the mountains. You figure out, are they opening their arms? Are they saying, get out of here? What, you know, what is... You're so describing when, base jumping too. Sitting yeah. on the edge and you sit there and you got to listen to the wind and you look at the terrain and look at the conditions and is, am I lining myself up for success or failure? Because the way I describe it is the jump is optional. Right. Performance afterwards is mandatory. Right. And I would imagine it's the same thing standing on the edge of uh, getting ready to go down a line. If, if you go... <laughs> unless you want to unclip and hike back up, you better, your performance on the downside of that is mandatory. Absolutely. And, th and then we also have, um, say take Tahoe where we are and we have different elevation of terrain. I think my favorite terrain in Tahoe is lower elevation. And so anyways, those two things, um, of just this, like my life based around, um, going into these mountains and interacting with snow and, and getting them on the perfect day. Um, naturally I am on the front lines of seeing change to snow and seeing, um, this medium changing the wrong way for me. Um, and, it, and it's this necessary medium for me to, um, you know, my life is shaped around snow. So to sit here in December and January, uh, in the rain, um, more than, you know, it, it, which is the new normal now, um, that's heartbreaking. And then that's coupled with, so naturally I start talking to scientists about it. I start reading about it and I'm like, wow, this the climate is changing and we, uh, humans are, um, the large cause of that. And so here I am, um, at that point i had had my name on a bunch of different products and I'm like, Hey, let's, um, let's come together as an industry and do it, you know, 
you know, I wanted to raise money to slow down climate change. So mm -hmm. talked to my buddy in the environmental field. I'm like, Hey, I want to start taking a percentage of my royalties off my pro model, send it to, um, a group on that's really focused on climate change. Where do I send the check? He comes back a week later and he's like, you need to start an organization. There's, you know, I can tell you where to send some checks, but like you guys as a group are not doing anything. You should be a leader on this wow. subject. And I hated that answer. Um, and I sat with it for a year, but I knew he was right. Uh, I tried to talk myself out of it. Um, and then the tipping point, I guess for me was, uh, you know, the main thing why I tried to talk myself out of it. One, I barely graduated high school. Two, at that point, I had an enormous carbon footprint. Um, and I just, re I'm like, who am I to like take on this stuff? And, but the tipping point for me was I was in Northern British Columbia and, um, I, it was mid when it was February and I was with some locals who were early thirties and we were hiking their home ski resort and it was grass and they were walking and they're showing me their warming hut and the different um, where they learned how to do their tricks and da, 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 da. And I was like, well, you know, why is the mountain closed? And, um, they're like, it, we just don't get snow here anymore. And it wouldn't have had the impact if they were 70 years old, but I thought, I'm like, wow, these guys are 30 and they've lost their mountain. Um, and this was coinciding with, I was spending a lot of time in Europe and amongst the glaciers in Chamonix, they've been around them and people going like, wow, we are, these glaciers are moving fast, going to Alaska, um, watching these glaciers change really fast, which glaciers do change. They're not supposed to change that fast, coupled with losing the low elevation spots here. Um, and I have this thought, I'm like, well, wow, man, if that happened to them, like, thank God that's not happening in my hometown. Um, I'm good, but that's a bummer for you guys. <laughs> and All right, so uh, get the plane ticket to somewhere else next year. <laughs> yeah, so I, um, so anyways, I'm like, you got to do it. And um, the haters are going to hate. And I just... And from the start, my motto was together we can protect our winners. And I really, um, like when we would run ads and stuff, I would have it of other athletes. When I went out for companies to be a part of it, um, I really looked for companies that I didn't work with. I, I did not want it to be a Jeremy Jones Foundation. Um, and then I seeked out the best uh, people on climate, the best scientists, and I had this motto of like, it never, you know, don't be afraid to ask. And I started asking the best people and they were like, this is awesome. I'm in. And it, um, and then also put it out there. I need help. Who knows how to do a website? And I'm like, either people rally around it and I ha and we have something. And if they don't, it's not going to go anywhere. And sure enough, we had lawyer, you know, a lawyer come in, help with getting our application, a website designer, so on and so forth. And we just celebrated our 10th year. Is that with the big day for POW? You were saying it's a big day for um, POW today? So this is open up a different can of worms, but we, today we just uh, launched the uh, Protect Our Winners uh, Action Fund, which we, so traditional nonprofit is a 5013C and we are now, um, we still have that, but we have this new arm of Protect Our Winners, which is a C4. And what that allows us to do is really take the gloves off and um, roll up our sleeves on specific um, political uh, races and back Do you candidates. need to borrow any body armor? <laughs> <laughs> so how was the response when you first started it? What was... Because I have a ton of questions on climate change. Um, how, what was your response when you first started? Were people, not necessarily people hearing about the concept, but the people you were approaching to talk about climate change, were they responsive or were they just like, yeah, get out of here. It doesn't matter. It snows here all the time. Um, no, in general, I mean, it's like you can't find a um, someone that is a professional skier or mountain guide that isn't like, yeah, I'm seeing changes. Um how about people who live in cities? 
well cities but again <laughs> you know if you look at the numbers um and the like I, I don't need to you know if if we can activate the existing um community we have all the numbers we need so it's why i don't spend time on the far right um on climate like we feel like and, and the numbers show like you know we're fighting to move the needle two percent mm -hmm. um in key areas um and so our goal is to get people off the sidelines uh it's it's not an effective use of resources to try and go in and tell this staunch climate denier um you know if if every science if every college in the world every scientist in the world uh can't get them on board with climate uh, that the climate's changing and humans are changing it i don't have the magic words i'm not putting energy towards that some people still think the world is flat and it's 2018 yeah, the flat earthers. Um, I'm just saying there's that always going to be that group of people that it's like, hey, man, here's every piece of data. Here's every piece of math. And they go, no, I don't believe you. Right. Move on to the next. Yes. <laughs> so trying to move at 2%, what would a 2% shift? Or I, I guess I should go backwards. Well, yeah. So first of all, when I started it, it was actually way less polarizing than it is now. So by and large, like, yeah, that's cool, man. It's re you know, love it. Um, and we were talking about changing light bulbs and reusable water bottles and, um, and reducing your personal carbon footprint, which we still talk about still super important, but pretty quickly we, as we surround ourselves with these experts, it became clear that to make, um, large um co2 reduction we need to do it on a um you know our whole infrastructure needs to change and we have to do it on a national and an international level and then so that ends up getting you into politics and when we started out into pol the first trip we went to politics you had mccain running for office talking about climate change, a Republican. Mm -hmm. um, there was a bill for a carbon tax that had passed the House. Um, and there get we went there to try and get it, um, you know, to specifically target um, Republican senators on it. And it was a it was a very um, it, it was not a toxic polarizing conversation at that time. Um, that greatly uh, has changed, and now it's this like, you know, has we know where it's gone now. With what do you think changed that? Um, it's pretty clear. A couple things: Citizen United, which is this, um, which allows um, big corporate companies to donate unlimited funds to campaigns. Um, but they wouldn't want anything in return, though. That's just charity. <laughs> totally. <laughs> um, the fossil fuel industry, who has been following it, right? You know, you can follow them and, and um, really closely. And as the science, be, you know, in, in this way, they saw that um, it was like a marquee Waxman bill. I forget what it was that was in um had to pass the house, but that was kind of a shot across their bow. And then they really ramped up their um, climate denial um, tactics, and they're very good at it. Do they deny that the climate is changing, or is there a denial that humans are what is changing the climate? So um, they're really what they do, and it's actually a, um, it's the same people. Um, and it's the same playbook that t the tobacco industry used, which they realized that their job um, wasn't to prove that cigarettes didn't cause cancer. Their job was to prove that cigarettes might not have caused cancer. <laughs> and that, um, that might. And so what the, the, the fossil fuel industry is, they recognize that if we just have this um, bring this might that humans may not have anything to do with it, that slows things uh, that slows things enough where they can keep business as usual cranking away, which is burning mass amounts of fossil fuels. Um, your answer might be anecdotal, but from what you've seen 
as far as the science, like people who obviously study this stuff, right. what's the percentage of people that are behind your stance versus the Citizen United uh, lobbying campaign? Is it? I mean, I, I would imagine that, and, and this is a guess, I would imagine that more of the science is on the trajectory or your path than it is on the defense or trying to create that wedge or opening the door for maybe, maybe not. Yeah, I mean, it's... Um you you can't find a peer-reviewed science paper on that humans aren't causing climate change you can't find a um, climate denier paper that's not uh, linked back to the fossil fuel industry mm -hmm. you can't to put it into perspective 98 percent of scientists um you know are on board with humans are causing the climate to warm um you know it's like 97 percent are on board that the earth is not flat i mean or that <laughs> cigarettes don't cause cancer i mean yeah. it is you're talking about it's there is not a single university in the world that is not doesn't teach this stuff there's i mean so it's it's there is no debate it, it is um so what do you, what's your response or what's your, uh, what do you encounter when you go and talk to politicians about this stuff who some may take money from those and some may not. I'd imagine your response is probably different depending on who they take funds from. But I, I would just imagine that I have limited exposure and experience with politicians in and of themselves by choice. Yep. I, I would find it to probably be an extremely frustrating experience. I'm curious as to what yours has been. Yeah. Um, it's, so we go, um, when we go to, I've been to Capitol Hill, um, three times since this last election. Um, cause that was a real, um, from an environmental perspective, it was like a nuclear bomb went and blew up, you know, 30 years of work. Um, and I basically had to decide, am I moving to Canada and going in a cabin? Um, <laughs> or am I going to roll up my sleeves and take this thing head on? Um, so we go to, um, in those trips, we go and, and meet pretty much exclusively with Republicans. And we try and find, um, Republicans in mountain areas that we think that we can um, try and move them on climate. And uh, how many of them have you found to really be educated on the topic beyond a, a talking point? So, just to and and mind you, um, when you say who takes what fossil fuel money, the and and I I, I hate the you know the the single biggest thing that is um, keeping us from going all in on these solutions is that it's become a political issue. Mm -hmm. It breaks my heart that it's a political issue. So I just want to, um, because, you know, we're, our, we are in the trenches on this political battle and it, and if I had known that when I started, I mean, I, it was the last thing that I wanted to do was going to Capitol Hill or having these, political battles and having it tied up to this, you know, it's like two sports teams, you know, the red and the blue, we're seeing yeah. it with every issue. It, it, it breaks my heart that it is, but Republican party is soaked in fossil fuel money. Um, this last election, 165 people spent 900 million keeping us on fossil fuels. Wow. And not only do they spend, they're very effective. I ha you know, I have to like really, they make that 900 million go really far because they terrify, um, they, you know, the Republican Party. If they come out on climate change, they know come to their primary, they're going to have another Republican that is going to blow the doors off that guy. Um, so, yeah, that I forget what your question was. Well, you said the Republican Party is. Oh, the science. Sorry. The the science. Science. So here's what we're up. My congressman who was up for reelection. I, we go in there and very, um, there's no 
tension in the room. We, you know, try and yeah. find common ground. Da, 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 you know, we know what we're up against. We're not. Uh, but so my congressman is zero for 187 on environmental votes. Strong. He, At least he's trending. Yeah. Well, he's consistent, <laughs> which I, he is not a flip flopper. <laughs> At least he's not like 90, 91. My God. <laughs> yeah. It's, I mean, I'm like, you, you know, know what you're what, getting. You know what you're getting. And he's, um, but so we go in and, um, and I, we ask him about, um, you know, I'd love to hear more about your science. You're here in Capitol Hill. You're access to the best scientists in the world. Like, please, you know, tell me why I, sh you know, should not like, we'll close down, protect our winners. Climate change isn't happening. And, you know, the first meeting I went in there, his, um, head aid cited, um, kindergarten when he learned about fossil fuels. The second time I went in and met with him directly, he, I'm pretty sure he was quoting, um, the Bible saying, you know, on the seventh day, <laughs> The earth flooded and Noah built his ark, which, you know, not, you know, so that's kind of the, yeah. the stuff that we're up against. I'm going to describe that as an uphill battle. <laughs> wow. So how many people do you have uh, in trenches with you? Because there's no way you're doing this by yourself. Specifically at Protect Our Winners? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Or so, even branched out. I mean, how far have you been able to grow it? In as long well, as you've had it? Um, for example, since this last election, we were three. Now we're 11. Uh, we basically have taken because the thing is. Um, we are there is urgency. These next two elections are critical. So at Protect Our Winners, we've just put every ounce of reserves, anything that we have into um everything we have to, you, so you're talking when you say the next two are you talking the midterm then the next presidential yes. um if we don't uh, yeah it's just it's it's an all hands on deck moment or is what we would say in the mountains it's a no fall zone um same term in uh base jumping too like, yeah hey you see to your left that's three thousand feet don't fall hold right. on to the rope if you want to so um so we have that. And then collectively, I guess the, the thing that has gotten us, um, say, an audience, um, not at this current White House, but in the last White House, um, we, you know, they really recognize the work we were doing because when we get everyone and protect our winners behind it, um, we reach about 12 million people on social media. Um, so that's a big number on a, in a, um, and say an avenue that's hard to, you know, tr for politicians, traditional, um, environmental groups to have an impact on. When you say it's like an all hands on deck, if unchecked, what does the science say we're headed towards? Well, best case scenario we're headed towards, um, you know, it, I mean, you could best, 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 like in a dream deal. And there's an outside chance would be 1.5 Celsius. Uh, but really best case is uh, two degrees Celsius warming that we're that are in per the books. year. No, in the next 50 years. We'll, okay. the so that's um, six degrees Fahrenheit. And, okay. You know, significant unchecked um and that's rate where scientists feel that we can adapt and um evolve and 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 learn you know that's still gonna you know trump's golf course is gonna be underwater uh, you know there's still major disruption yeah. of um people there's um areas where you know millions of people are going to be moved um, we could make an attempt to pace it though is yeah that... and we can make the um make you know we can handle that um unchecked we just stay on business as usual right now i mean there's years now you're talking about how long will human beings be on earth is it a hundred and hundred years is it 200 years and there's debate on that i mean it's it'll be the end of you know because if you start getting to four degree you know all these um triggers start going and then you have this runaway climate change that there's really no end in the warming and 
I don't know what that, it's something, you know, like a four or a six degree Celsius increase that we shut down as a human race. That's enough to keep you up at night. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, as one climate scientist said to go into military terms. Um, and by the way, the Pentagon through all this is totally on board on climate. No kidding. 100%. I mean, <laughs> how did you guys end up interfacing with them? I would have never thought that that would have been a touch point. So after the election, um, I kind of, I wrote this, um, this email um, kind of note to, to like the main people at protect our winners, which was basically kind of like a brain dump. I love to write and, um, and in it, um, I'm like, we need to get the Republicans on board. Um, we got to find one and then we'll find two and da, 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 but it ended up being published by TGR. Um, and I got a note, um, that day from a Republican in the Pentagon going, you know, we are, um, there's more Republicans than you think that want action on climate. Um, and then the Pentagon continues to release public reports on climate change is a, there's a big report on, um, Guam, hmm. um, where the Pentagon is going. We may, you know, this base is in jeopardy. We're in jeopardy of losing this, this key strategic base. Yeah. I've been to that base in the it's, next 50 yeah. years. Um, the drinking water is a big problem as the sea levels rising as salt water is going into their, um, drinking water. I would, if you'd have given me a hundred guesses of organizations that you would have support from the Pentagon would not have made that list. <laughs> the, um, there's already, there's major flooding at, um, one of the East coast bases that you may have been on. Um, uh, it depends on where it is, but I mean, yeah, it's in Virginia or something somewhere in that deal, though, but sunny day flooding. Oh, I know. I know. I sure. I know the area of what is it? It's not Virginia beach. It's the Newport news area. There's a huge naval base there. The East yeah. coast teams are there in little Creek. And then, so they're like that base. Um, they recognize that, that, you know, that base they're losing that base. Yeah. Um, so and then, sorry, the, yeah. the big thing why they recognize it as a military threat, because in like in India and that part of the world, there's a ton of people that are living um, where sea level rise is going to move millions of people. It's going to displace and them. It's, it's coming. At two degrees Celsius, those people are going to be underwater. We know that's coming. We know these people are going to be displaced. So the Pentagon looks at mass displacement of people as um, that's going to disrupt things. So the most common thing I personally hear when it comes to climate change, and I think this is, I don't want to say an excuse for people, but I think it's a wedge to basically let them take a, a sidestep and avoid the issue. So I'm curious as to what the scientists say that you deal with. And, and it goes along the lines of, well, that's great. We can do anything we want to here in the U.S., but if the rest of the world doesn't get on board with what we're yeah. doing, what's the point anyway? So it's it's almost like this yeah. doomsday thing, right? Like, totally. what's the matter? Because great, look at um, China. You yeah. Know? So this is a you know the China question used to terrify me eight years ago because um, they're right, um, but if you look at China, who is totally embraced the issue number one manufacturer of electric cars. If you go for China to um, get a license plate, it costs $10,000. If it's an electric. What? <laughs> yeah, because they don't want cars on the road. Oh, I see. You know what I mean? Yeah, so it's a, um, rewarding the it's a, to get your car on the road is a $10,000 deal. Electric car, they waive the price. So they are putting wind into the sales on electric cars going, becoming the, the number one producer of electric cars, renewable energy. They put on more renewable energy online than the, um, in one year than the U S has, has, you know, in the last 10 years. So they are operating at this incredibly fast, um, transition um and for sure don't get me wrong they still are burning a ton of fossil fuels and yeah. what have you but and at the heart of it though this is where things really get sad for me is china recognizes it as a um 
as an opportunity, a, a, a business opportunity. It's coming. I mean, the, we're, we're down to the fossil fuels that we need to get to now. They're hard to get to, which means you have more oil spills, more, um, it, it, you know, it, it costs more to get it. Um, we, it's a fact we will run out of fossil fuels. China notes, sees this change, um, and, uh, and, uh, this change from fossil fuels to renewables represents a huge opportunity for jobs already in the U S it's, um, you know, it's some, I don't know the exact number, but significantly more jobs in the renewable sector than, um, the fossil fuel industry today. Um, so they recognize that it's opportunity and that's where it gets, um, heartbreaking. You know, if you go back to America, like we have been this forward thinking on the forefront, new ideas, technology, leader of the world. And then we currently are like, hold on, we are going to dig in on the past and we are going to um, do everything we can to resist change. And it's, um, and so we're getting passed up by the rest of the world. I heard somebody say one time, in the you know juxtaposing uh, U.S. mentality versus uh, even Asian culture, but China specifically, they do a good job of forecasting generationally. You're right. And we are like, hey, look at what's two feet in front of my face. And uh, what you're describing sounds exactly like that. And then to go um, also, so then you go to India, um, another like great. That's the other place that people will throw at you. Like, what about India? Totally. Yeah. So what's going on? So the Paris Agreement, for example, um, in that is there's um you know significant money to help india forego fossil fuels and get them onto renewables and so that you know by pulling out of the paris agreement that significantly changes um india's power infrastructure moving forward yeah, because we're removing their ability to put it in place via yeah. the economics, well, right? Yeah, totally. So, um, again, to put wind in the sale of renewables. Um, and so, yeah, the you know that's where that Paris Agreement, not perfect, but a huge step in the right direction. And for the U.S. to pull out of that um, puts us, the only other country in the world is Syria. It's a destination location. I don't know if you've been. <laughs> Have you a great country? I mean, <laughs> no disrespect to the Syrians, but not known for, you know, cutting I don't think edge. they have a lot of boarding um, either. Yeah, not, you know, not. Is there any good boarding in China? There definitely is. Have um, you been? No, but um, it's a huge, um, I'd say it represents some of the biggest unknown, um, unexplored mountains in the world. 2019 plans? Yeah, I mean, yeah, China's um, on the radar, main, you know, again, mainly to, so what's happening in China is they have this whole new middle class, um, which is great, but they're trying to, you know, they, they now have time and money, and it's really important, what we call Eco 101, which is going to them and saying, hey, going to these beautiful, you have some of the most beautiful wilderness areas in the world, and going there and spending time there is very fulfilling and um, this incredible expand you can see it in Yosemite it's filled with Chinese um, so trying to get them on board with like you have incredible um, wilderness and you need to protect it I've been to China uh, one time I passed through but another time I was there <laughs> solar up when yeah. it cause I couldn't even see across the street. It was bad, but also in China, I've heard, seen pictures from miles, the mountains that he's been there based. I'm like, are you kidding me? It looks like uh, avatar. Yeah. Some of the most unbelievable, spectacular scenery I've ever seen. That's funny. You point out all the Chinese people at uh, Yellowstone. You said, it's totally true too. I didn't put right. those two together. <laughs> it's, they actually have better stuff uh, in their own backyard. Is there a tipping point? 
that uh, that can't be recovered from based off the scientists you work with? Like if it hits a certain point, regardless of what human beings do, other than probably killing half of us. Yeah, and, and I don't have that. The, that number varies, but yeah, I think like right around that four to six uh, degrees Celsius increase is this tipping point. And from there, it's... Yeah, so, and, and I... Um, I was talking to a climate scientist and he's like to go back to this military term. Um, he's like, it's as if we have all these, um, you know, it, these tanks and um, aircraft carriers and stuff like rolling into our border and off the coast and we're all rolling around and not seeing them. Um, meaning like there is a war coming and, um, which is this changing of the climate. And we're, you know, walking around going, this is, everything's perfect and there's no risk out there. Yeah, that's not a, that's not a very safe environment to be in from a military perspective, for sure. So how is mission statement is 2% change? 2% improvement? Well, our mission, so right now what we have going right now, and when, when I say 2%, I mean... We're coming into these midterm elections. Um, we are focused on battleground states uh, where we have a large footprint of uh, people and um, where the elections are going to be tight. And if we can, and why that is important, um, for example, we're, we, you know, drilling off the coast of California, Arctic, um, up in the Arctic, that Congress approved that. How many votes, you know, the difference on that vote is about four votes. Yeah. So if we can change those four votes, um, you're talking about actually like a pretty significant change to the direction our country's taking. And, you know, you mentioned earlier, you're saying that, you know, the Republican Party is pretty steeped in let's call it oil and gas money yeah. or fossil fuels. Do you see any of that on the uh, left side of the aisle as well? Does it, do they, do they do a good job spreading their tentacles across both or is it pretty cut and dry across the parties? It's to me, my understanding is it's cut and dry. Um, we have not, we have no, yeah. I mean, there's not a, just watching really close to like who's approving Keystone XLs and stuff. There's not a Democrat out there that's approving that. Um, They're voting pretty much just rank and file. Yeah, they. Um, yeah. So since you've been paying attention to climate change, since at first the alarm bells went off for you, what's the most effective rebuttal that you've heard? The the problem, or the question that, or the statement that you've had the hardest time addressing. Well. I think um, there's this, I mean, the, it's really hard to like come and like cite some science or what, like I don't, I don't really, um, th there's just nothing that's going to, you know, win the science, you get scientists on board, you want to like make that a debate in science, I'll listen. Yeah. But as soon as you... I mean, if you think of it and you think of these Republicans that many of them went to these great universities and they use it as a credential to get into office. Well, they, you know, they contradict, they have extreme contradiction to the colleges <laughs> that they're using to say, look how smart I am. I went to Harvard. Well, you clearly failed the science class. Um, <laughs> or you got a huge check stroke to you. Right. And the, and the, I guess the thing that bothers me about the Republican Party is um, just call a spade a spade. You go in and talk to a Texas Republican and go, hey, you know, and he says, hey, you know what? The fossil fuel industry is huge in my in my district, in my state. It employs X yeah. amount, brings this much economy. How can I not support that? I'm going to get killed. It's going to have that is a valid discussion um west virginia it's gonna these coal mines are killing us um we it's killing our jobs valid discussion yeah um well, but going and like pulling like unicorns out of the sky and like making up fake science to defend that like that get we gotta get past that it's a valid discussion in the terms of their re-election cycle 
it becomes a less valid discussion when you think generationally or the impact right. that it could have. I get their desire to be in that seat, but wouldn't it, I don't know, that this is where I struggle too when people take that myopic, they look at a calendar and all they can see is the date on it instead right. of realizing that there's multiple pages and multiple dates. I would like for yeah. my I would like for my kids to be able to board for the rest of right. their life, even though they, their skill level disgusts me after one afternoon. <laughs> it's I, yeah, I mean, it's tough. So I'm totally on the outside. You're in the trenches. Right. I'm aware that there's a trenches. I'm not even like looking into them with binos, but it's tough because I just I constantly encounter arguing and yelling and just gah, 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 yes no yeah. yes no and there's like nothing in between you got one percent one percent 98 percent right it's va it's like the grand canyon between the two and there's just mortars and so i end up just i shut it off which i know is the wrong approach but that's i know. think it's important to be i mean you need to um it is important to take breaks from the stuff i mean you can't for me i've really had to learn that and um it's just, there's too much like there and have real filters on when, you know, how much news I consume, where it comes from. Um, and just not, you know, at the end of the day, we talked about it. I mean, you, you fought hard for this country to have yeah. these freedoms and America right now we have issues. Um, but let's make no mistake about it. One, if you're born in America, you have hit the lucky gene, gene pool club. I mean, that, that um, it's an incredible opportunity to this day in America. There's a lot of great things to point to. If you, um, as far as being born today um, on this planet, we may look back and go, that was the golden era of humanity. Um, so let's not walk around and um like we have some major problems and and to to the fact that we have it better than any other um it, 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 today is a better time to be alive than any other time and you know we're in this largely this great peace life expectancy is um way up from what it used to be there's more clean drinking water than than ever before there's less starvation than ever before you have um God, you know, God bless the um, technology of new hips, knees. and oh, uh, <laughs> My dad wouldn't be walking around. Yeah, without. I'm out in the mountains, like crushing mountains with people with new hips and knees. And, <laughs> you know, I'm a 43-year-old uh, pro athlete. And, you know, in, in, in 80 years ago, I'd be on, you know, kind of, you don't know, live past 80, 43. Um, so, but with that... Um, you know, we have this great time to be alive um, and, and you have to celebrate it. And that, again, go back to what you fought for. Um, and it's a disservice not to go out every day and drink up some form of life and and, and have that joy and, and love of life. Um, but there is, it's a shame if we, you know, we have this golden ticket and, and I equate it to like, we've been on this, um, we've been at this great dinner party and, um, and it's just been so much fun and it's a pool party and it's all this and, and the checks coming and we're basically like, all right, sneak out the back door and you hand the check to the kids. Dine and ditch. <laughs> totally. <laughs> and I can't hand that check to the kids. Um, you know, we are setting them, we're, we're handing this baton to them that, um, is not as good as when we got it. And that, that breaks my heart. Yeah, I agree. I, uh, it's funny when, um, people ask me all the time about freedom. Right. Uh, one, one question I get all the time is the NFL kneeling, right? Yep. Um, because people immediately associate the flag with the military, even though I'm relatively sure it's owned by all of us in the U S right. not just the 0.05% in the military. <laughs> And I'm honest to, with them with my answer and, and because they ask me if it pisses me off. And I say, no, it doesn't. To me, what is uh, unsettling or upsetting is not somebody exercising their freedom. It's somebody having all the freedom in the world and doing nothing with it. I'd rather have somebody kneel. Like, the, they must come out and stand. Ain't wrong answer in my book. That is not what this country is founded on. Do I like it? No. 
Do I agree with it? No. Could it be construed as disrespectful? Sure, depending on the, which way right. you look. Do I want to live in a world where they don't have that choice? No. So it's not to Do me. you – that's a beautiful answer. Um, does it – how do you think that stacks up amongst – um, the rest of the military. I would say I am uh, in the minority. Right. Um, most of the military uh, leans pretty far to the right. I mean, it's yeah. a self, self-selecting career path. Um, not that I am the most objective person in the world by any stretch, but I think I've become more so as I've gotten older. I'm 40 yep. on the outside, and I think I'm about 98 on the inside <laughs> as far as what my body feels like when I wake up. But... Um, a lot of the younger guys get very emotional about it because, I mean, I carried a flag with me on every target I've ever been on. It was underneath my body armor or in my backpack. Really? It means a lot. And yeah. the last time I've seen far too many of my friends is in coffins draped in a flag. And there's, uh, God, Facebook. <laughs> if I, I need to give the grid coordinates for that place for a <laughs> nuclear strike. But it's neither here nor there. Um, I just wish people were... Uh, they would have a conversation like you and I are as opposed to fuck you. And that's right. all they say. Um, Recognize the source of their news. Oh God. <laughs> no, if it's on the internet, it's true. You didn't know right, that. Totally. Um, but the young guys there in the, on, internally, there's some, uh, there's some Facebook pages, uh, pages that are for seal specific secret groups or whatever they are. And this stuff will come up and it's mostly, it's like, you know, F you coward, this, that, or the other. And it's just, it's like, guys, you're losing the forest for the trees. You don't, like, that's the point. Like, right. freedom of speech is not whether or not I like what you're saying. It's the fact that you can get get to say it. Right. And instead of yelling at the people for taking a knee, maybe just take a moment to understand their perspective or look at it from their perspective and see what they're trying to achieve. Now, a lot of the pro athletes, I would say, maybe have a thinner understanding of what they're protesting, what they're trying to achieve, but that's still their right. Right. And I would be more than happy that like people are like, oh, I wish I could go on the field and kick them in the face. It's like, first off, he might look like three inches tall on your TV. That man's <laughs> seven foot three and 400 pounds. He will beat your ass. Second off, you'd be better off having a conversation with the person. And you know, that goes back to like when we go and visit these Republicans is, is I actually, you know, if I'm going to dinner and there's a, guy with a Trump hat on, I want to sit next to him and not to try and get him to take the Trump hat off. I just, I want to, I want to get him talking and just try to understand yep. their perspective. And I think it's really important to, um, you know, it, it, there's this great, um, and to kill a mockingbird, which is probably the first book that I ever read, um, where there's a line where it says, you don't know a man until you've walked a mile in his shoes. And it's, you really got to understand. Um, and, and that's the thing with these, the climate deniers, I totally understand. And it goes back to why it's a, it's, it's really sad that it's this political issue because, you know, yeah, you're on the right for my dad grew up, um, Republican. He likes small business, uh, or small, you know, small government, low taxes. You're not the worst human being in the world to, to feel that way. Um, but it's, you know, so having these conversations, um, to understand what creates these views and then you understand, you know, I was driving back. Um, I was just with this guy who was telling me, um, this polar explorer, Eric Larson. Um, and he was telling me about how he thinks he's the last person to walk to the North Pole because he basically had to swim to it. Um, it's un basically, it's untenable. And it was the last person to walk to it in summer. Um, and he's like, I, we pretty much had to swim to it. And I'm driving home, and I'm listening to Rush Limbaugh because I, I want to understand what's creating these climate deniers. And he gives this, this very... Um, powerful talk on how um the uh, the arctic is not shrinking it's actually growing the satellite images are all a hoax and da 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 and the planet's getting getting colder and it's all this conspiracy and da, 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 and and i mean he is nailing it it's like this nine minute thing and i'm like oh sweet i'm 
this is great. I can just move on with my life and get over all this protect our winners stuff. And you're getting woke. Yeah. And then I'm like, Oh shit. I just <laughs> talked to the guy who had to swim to the North pole. And, um, and so, but my point is, is yeah, someone relates to it and, and, um, likes, um, rush Limbaugh and then they start eating up that side of things. And, and, and that's where at protect our winners, we really were a single issue voting deal. We want Republicans. We want you to be able to have your stance on other parts of life, but we feel like we should all agree, um, on climate. And, and that's, um, what we're focused on. No one has ever not been elected because of their stance on climate change. We hope to change that because um, we think once that changes, everything will happen. And, and to equate it to the cigarette industry, there was a long time where politicians' stance on cigarettes didn't matter if they were getting elected or not. And it eventually, it, you know, all it takes is one guy to lose a seat over his stance on something, and you'll start to see real change. They used to have ads with doctors smoking. My doctor <laughs> prefers Marlboros. I would love to see that ad in the modern day. But like, yes. uh, let's get that medical license and revoke it. What's the end state for people like Rush Limbaugh? So saying all of that's a hoax, like what's, I don't understand the end state. Are they, are they just trying to, to maintain the flow of money in the industries that are entrenched in the, yeah, I mean, Rush Limbaugh's given talks at the Heartland Institute, which is this um, incredibly effective climate denier um, group uh, funded by the Koch brothers. Um, so again, you know, it's he's swimming in fossil fuel. It money. comes back to money. It just comes back to money. And money um, is, you know, money effectively spent. When it, and when we say money, I mean, you go to the Heartland Institute they, um, you know, they are good. They're hitting climate change at every level. They, I think it was last year, they sent out 245,000 um, lesson plans to, um, to different school, you know, schools around the country to change the way they teach science and to get um, climate uh the climate change uh, may not be human caused into the curriculum so they control the scientific or the curriculum in our school's uh, science classes is there a organization on the other side that's trying to counter that i mean there is there's that we work with a um, group called ace uh, that does that but just the funding on that um you know, we right now we are, um, you know, we're, we're little hummingbirds fighting dragons um, and you can win, but we need lots of hummingbirds and we just don't have enough of them right now. Which is a perfect segue into my next question for. So for me, I mean, this, this is the longest conversation I've ever had about climate change for <laughs> sure, no, but is good. And I know I'm not the only person in that right. boat. What would you point to as a portal or a reference or an objective starting point that is not tainted by money on either side? Some where people can gather their own information. Where would you point people who, because I think I'm more in the norm than the anomaly when it comes to my knowledge being right. super low. I mean, there is, um, I mean, I peer reviewed science. I mean, you really want to peer, peer, peel back the layer just look at peer reviewed science on climate change. And, um, do you have any go to websites? Um, I, you know, I can give you, um, some websites off of, and why I, what I don't want to do is just hand you these, like, you know, um, like I, w I want to hand you websites that maybe are come as far from the right as possible. Yep. Um, and you know, cause I think that's the, the, the key to that is to, to not just be like, here's far left media, like follow grist.com for your climate. You know, that's this, uh, <laughs> that's just, you know, you're going to get turned off on a million different reasons for, you know, the, on the vegetarian article or what have you. It's um, so I think it's important. Uh, I think it's super important to understand 
where your um, news comes from and you can there's different um, Vox had this really good infograph and it has you know on one end of the spectrum is far right clickbait far left clickbait and then you know you kind of get into the middle and I you know I like um, I like reading right wing news left wing news center news you know it's but it's you got to know when you're on a certain website like oh yeah these guys are far left they're always going to push stuff to the drag it to the left these guys are going to drag stuff to the right you know and and uh, but just understand what who's behind creating that news yeah if you're reading an article that's from the onion don't take it as a uh, <laughs> documentary or a nonfiction. which i actually know a few people that maybe they were i don't know a few cocktails deep I'm like look at this i'm like oh <laughs> Man. And by and large, um, <laughs> just to get past the, the Facebook, um, uh, you know, I'd say that's the, been the, probably the worst trend of like this Facebook clickbait um, oh, yeah. news that starts from a blog post with a bunch of maybes and um, reportedly's and things like that that turn into like bulletproof news. Um, it's amazing the rocket fuel some of those things get. That's the really sickening them. stuff. Yeah, I mean it's one thing you know whether you're Fox or CNBC, but there's just a whole nother level of fake news going on at Facebook that um, that's kind of a non-starter for me. If you start reciting um, these like conspiracy Facebook <laughs> stuff, it's like, dude, I, I can't, sorry, dude, I can't go there. I, I, I hate I'm it. I'm out. I got, there's not enough time in the day to go down those rabbit holes. I, I wish actually more people would realize that, that uh, there's better things to do. And mind you, to be uh, clear, they're on both sides of the, on For the sure. aisle on that. That's an important point. I think uh, it's happening on both sides. And it's the people on the far extremes of both sides that I think are taking up most of the bandwidth. Yep. Everybody else is like the delicious filling of an Oreo sandwiched totally. between the two of them. <laughs> so how can people, if they wanted to, uh, find out more about POW and support POW? Yeah, so we, you know, we're protectourwinners.org. Um you know, very active, um, say, you know, on our Instagrams and Facebook and Twitters of constantly, um, you know, simple to drive you to the latest news. Um, we have a pretty robust voter guide going in and, um, or, you know, where you can really understand uh, the candidate's stance on climate, stance on the environment. And um, to be clear, uh, you know, nothing would make me happier than, um, and this is, this will like cause a lot of environmentalists to, to maybe throw up, but. Um, Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think the like, I can step down from, uh, you know, I actually like this news about this uh, action fund. I'm the chair of this board, which means I am really rolling my sleeves and getting deep on the, um, on the climate front, but I will resign from that <laughs> being the chair of that board and go live in my cabin and, and go quietly when we have a Republican president that is a champion on climate. To me, that represents that we are now as a country working together to embrace um, this, you know, the challenge of our lifetime, uh, and and we are, are, you know, as a complete country, putting all our resources towards it. And I think we can look at um, when we've done that as a country, we have done phenomenal things, uh, you know. And I guess the the most recent um, or the grandest example would be, you know, your, your Normandy to go back to like a, a, a um, military reference of, mm -hmm. you know, really, um, or, or, you know, what the birth of this country, which is a bunch of farmers coming together to fight this big empire. So collectively the United States can do, um, you know, we can't be stopped. And, um, and I think that, ironically or, or one of the best examples would be it, it, why a republican climate champion in office just shows me that it's no longer a political issue at that point i would agree are you hopeful or are you uh concerned that you'll see that in your lifetime 
I think I'll see it. You know, the truth always um, wins. It's getting way harder. I, could, I should say, you know, when we go in and talk to um, these Republicans, it's very much um, now it's behind closed doors, you know, no cameras. Um, they are, which is, you know, here you do, you have this like, what science is telling us is the um, biggest challenge facing humanity moving forward. And you can't even get them to go on record on their science. Um, wow, and that's an indication of how scared they are. Yeah. So, and again, to put myself in their shoes, I get it. Yep. I do too. They, you know, they want to keep their job and um, which I think is the problem with our politicians is we are, we, you know, we have too many, uh, we don't have leaders saying and, and bringing new ideas and educating, like, I know you've never heard of this or our climate tax <laughs> is terrifying, but give me an opportunity to explain why I'm all in on a climate tax and this is good for America. Um, but yeah, so I, I get what creates the climate denier. I understand why that um, Republican... It, it, but they're in a tricky uh, situation, and I think, um, you know, that hopefully these next two elections, I think, are going to be tight. I think it's going to be a dogfight, but um, I think, you know, maybe in um, two presidential elections from now, the debate will be on what the best um, – moves are forward to tackle climate change and like let's have debates on the solutions is it microgrids is it this is it you know what that's what we should be debating right now um because we don't have all the answers but we're stuck um and quite frankly we're not even debating um climate i mean the in this last election there was um it I think the word climate change on these, you know, the, these presidential debates was probably mentioned a handful of times. Um, and that's because it's a, right now it's a, somewhere it lies in between a, a number eight and number 12 issue of yeah. importance for voters. That was in the post you made too, that original one. Um, yeah. And until we get that into a top three issue, the candidates are, their feet aren't going to be put to the fire on their stance. They can really just brush through that. Um, and, you know, we kind of need to, or we, we absolutely need to move that up the list of importance. Do you find, uh, watching you from a distance, it seems like about once a year you just go charging somewhere. <laughs> Do you find that to be a pretty good uh, refresh and you can get an appreciation for what it is you're in the trenches for? Yeah, it's funny. We um, we have this kind of um, joke that we've always had where, um, you know, we say, you know, I like to say I'm a uh, – Devout member of the Church of the Seven Day Recreationalist, <laughs> <laughs> and it's as this you know this last election everything went sideways. Uh, my buddies and I were talking. We're like, dude, this like this you know the Church of the Seven Day Recreationalist is actually like super important because um, without that we would be an unglued mess if we didn't have this daily um, interaction with nature and uh, so yeah the importance of that has only risen and I think it's um, and it's also part of why the my standards of snow quality or wave quality has gone way down because i'm just kind of in the trenches a little bit um with the climate stuff and then i you know you put me out in the ocean watching a sunset and it's just like oh my god this is just the <laughs> best thing in the world thank you thank you thank you i am so happy now <laughs> and then your energy bar is full and you can come back and get back in the trenches yeah, and it, and it just puts importance on, um, again, like why we need passions in our life. And it, um, it, and I think looking at kids, like we need to, in our schools, there's very little talk about um, how to have a fulfilled and happy life. It's all about getting into the best college and getting, making as much money as possible um, yeah. at the expense of everything else. I have, uh, so my oldest is going to be a freshman, then I have an eighth grader, and my daughter is 10, going on about 40. 
It's going to be in fifth grade. And yeah, I've never seen a lesson plan come home that's, this is how you pursue a fulfilling and enriching life, which is, you know, it, I remember my parents didn't ask me too much, hey, what do you want to do for right. a living? And I don't really, I'll ask my kids occasionally just to get their temperature. But my response is, you know what, take your time. Because they'll say, I don't know. I'm like, you know what, neither do I. I'm 40. I'll let you know if I figure out a formula. You got all the time in the world, but just find something to do that you love to do. Totally. And you, I mean, you never, when you hear about these horrific acts um, that have been happening. Man, um, that's another rabbit hole. And I hole. don't want to go down that rabbit <laughs> yeah. hole um, at all. Uh, it, but it's never like, you know, Joe Blow just got done from a three-day backpack trip and came in and grabbed, you know, and did yeah. this horrific act or, um, you know, went surfing and or snowboarding and then on his way home from the mountain went and did this horrific act. And then that's where the Church of the Seven-Day Recreationalist is like, hey, man, you <laughs> come to the church, man. You'll be way happier. I uh, I find for myself that anytime I I don't think I've ever been lost in the woods because unfortunately it was hammered into my head never to be lost. <laughs> but as close as I can get to losing myself in the woods is more who I find out who I am. Right. The harder I push, I mean, it was ingrained in me. It was ingrained in me super young, and I think if we ingrained it, like my kids are crazy active. Um, four seasons, you know, I got awesome. my daughters riding horses. We're on the lake doing lake stuff. Kids are. My boys are already like, hey, Dad, you get the season pass? I'm like, just chill out. I'll get the season <laughs> pass, right? It's not on sale yet. Just take it easy. I think if more people did those type of things, there'd be more inherent appreciation and then desire to understand what is going on in the climate. Because you, you've you seen it more than right. most people. And it, even in Montana, where I live now, I, I'm not going to say I understand where the climate deniers are coming from, but I can see where they'll use it. Like, hey, man, we got 410 inches of snow. Right. And we totally. got, and it rained for like the last two months straight, and look how green everything is. But it's like, yeah, that we're a little micro system. Well, you're also like really curbing the um, everything for, you know, you can like the perspective on things. Because if you really peel back, um, the layers of, you know, we work with a fish guide who's like, you know, the rivers now, they used to never close. Now they close because they're getting too warm. Mm -hmm. um, so they can't fish. Um, they're losing uh, kind of a key part of their season, which is middle of August to September is now largely off the records. Um, you know, the forest fires. Um, and then also how much it's snowing um, at, you know, where that those snow levels are. Uh, the fro like the I guess the pine bark beetle is mm -hmm. a great example. Montana is losing millions of trees, and that's due to warming of winters. And it's it has something to do with the normally a healthy tree will push it out with the sap, right? But at a certain temperature, I might be totally wrong. So we need like we need a certain amount of like really cold days mm -hmm. to kill the beetle, um, and we're just not getting those that that those long cold stretches. Yeah, because you can see sections of forest that are just Yeah, so done. because, and so Montana, which I'm sure your wife is there going, it is cold. And you're like, well, actually, historically, it was like 20 below for 40 days of winter. And that that, that cold snap is what would kill the um, beetle. Yeah. And that, so, you know, that, that um, those big cold, um, stretches are not happening. So again, you point to nature, nature in Montana is screaming climate change. Um, the trees are, the fish are, uh, the animals are. Um, and, and so that's, well, my brother-in-law and sister were just up in glacier. We can see, uh, the kind of the opening to glacier national park from our house. And they said the that, glaciers are <laughs> so, and that's what I was going to go to. My brother-in-law said he was reading a sign that if, uh, by 2020, they think that glaciers might be gone yeah. in glacier national park, Totally. which I guess then it'll just be national park. But, and then, you know, to add to your climate denier, uh, buddies, they'll go, well, glaciers are always, uh, receding, but uh, which is true. You know, they're growing or receding, but the rate um, of this receding is unprecedented. Yeah, it's a 
it's a long topic to wrap your head around yeah, for sorry, sure. Totally. No, um, it's all right. I guess in closing on my deal, um, the last point that I would like to make is that, um, again, you know, from a climate perspective, um, this last election went the way that it did off of 50,000 votes in seven key districts. Wow. Um, we're not in the, you know, the clean power plan is gone. Paris agreement's gone. Um, the, yeah. So we, these major, um, things in, a, in America where we took this left turn is gone off of a very small amount of votes. So every vote matters. Um, and it's, that's another one I hear often. It's like, what, what does my vote mean? I didn't realize the margin was 50,000. I mean, that's, I mean, if you peel back exactly yeah. what state and what it took in those states, incredibly tight, um, microscopic in comparison to the whole microscopic. And then 70% of Americans are concerned on climate change. Um, it's just, again, it's not a, a key issue. And, and for the Republicans that are listening to this, Start putting your Republicans' feet against the fire and get them um, to, you know, to, to answer the hard questions on climate change and ideally get them to be a climate champion. And I am an eternal optimist, and, and um, one example of optimism we are seeing on Capitol Hill is we have this um, bipartisan climate solutions caucus where you can only um, join if it's a Republican and a Democrat joined together. Oh, interesting. Now, every Democrat would be on there, but you can't find the Republicans <laughs> find to partner. go on. But w with that, there is, um, I think there's currently 32 Republicans that are in the bipartisan climate uh, solutions caucus. So, uh, you know, four years ago, there were zero. That's improvement right there. So if you're a Republican, write your senator, write, or write your congressman um, and and care about climate change. Get him on that because that's a that's a major step for us. I dig it. One final question. You ready to shift gears? Yes. This one's from the brother-in-law. What influence did Craig Kelly have on your writing style? Oh, God, we could have done a whole <laughs> podcast on Craig. Um, so Jason, my brother-in-law, he rips on a board. Like you said, he's pissed that I'm here. So, Jason, I hope you hear this and you're even more pissed. Nice. But yeah. I'm getting the question in for him. He gets the closing question. Well, just the mention of Craig, like, makes my, you know, palms sweat and, spent, you know, sends spine tingle down. Uh, makes my and my spine uh, tingle, but Craig is um, he was a huge. I mean, I think he was the compass of snowboarding for a long time, and when he passed away, the sport really lost its way. And to sum up sum up what Craig did, I mean, he was a um, you know world champ. Then at the peak of his career. Um, stopped competing, started focusing on free riding. That was a radical idea. At the peak of that, said, I'm done with riding in front of cameras. Now I'm going to become a uh, mountain guide, and my goal is to take everyday snowboarders and show them the best day of their life. Uh, wow. And he passed away uh, in an avalanche getting trying to be the first splitboard um approved mountain guide in north america and maybe the world um but yeah his um influence is significant as you saw in life of glide the last film i did i uh dedicated to craig i'll put i'm gonna put links on the uh itunes things to the film as well because it'll give a lot of context to uh to what we're talking about i have another question because it just triggered my memory avalanches uh, terrified of them. Never been in one. Should be. Yeah. Have you been in an avalanche? I've definitely been in some avalanches. Um, I've never been in a, like a, it's, it's kind of hard to explain, but we'll be in certain situations where it's totally, um, where the, the snowpack is very safe. Uh, then it will snow, say six inches on top of a, a safe snowpack. So we'll go out and we realize that those top six inches are easy to um, start an avalanche mm -hmm. with the top six inches. So we go to 
small, you know, imagine a small shoot with a clean out run. Like at times we will go and, um, and mess around with these really small avalanches, which you should never do at home. Um, and I actually really don't do that anymore. Cause it, I, I feel like it, um, it sends a, it kind of glorifies avalanches. Um, but I've never been in a situation where we were really concerned about big avalanches. Um, and then had one start when that happens, when the avalanche danger goes to high, yeah. uh, I sleep great at night because uh, I know I'm not getting into avalanche terrain. Where I don't sleep well at night is when the avalanche danger is uh, moderate and it's uh, totally stable, and I, you know, I know that I have an opportunity to ride a really serious line in perfect conditions, or what we call spooky moderate, which is what killed Craig Kelly. Um, where it's unlikely for an avalanche to happen, mm -hmm. but if one happens, it's going to be catastrophic. And that stuff, that's when it's time to grab your surfboard and go on vacation. Go elsewhere. What would you say the number one killer is in the backcountry? Spooky moderate um, avalanche terrain and cornices. Um, but meaning the high avalanche terrain, there's enough information out there. If you're getting caught in an avalanche, because um, there is the avalanche forecasting is incredible. Josh was showing me some of that stuff. Yeah, websites. I mean, we're, yeah. websites um, where if you're if you're in a populated area, there is real. There's people going out every day and evaluating the snowpack. Um, so as long as you're, you know, this deep instability in the snowpack that you'll get in Montana and Colorado, which is complex, meaning, un, you know, that's where they, um, unlikely for an avalanche to happen, but if it happens, it's huge. Um, but in general, it's like you learn how to read that avalanche report and um, you can learn a ton of information and there's no reason to be caught in these major avalanches on a high avalanche day. Yeah, there was somebody um, killed in what they, th I wouldn't even call it a major, but they think was an avalanche just off the big mountain allows, it has yep. access to some trailhead stuff. I did just a little bit and they, I mean, they found a body. They couldn't find it because there was a huge dump afterwards. They yeah. found it as it thawed right under where this guy was kind of taking me through for my kind of my first backcountry stuff near the resort. I would have never guessed it would have slid there where they found him. Right. This was, was like, okay, I know. Absolutely that nothing. That means it was probably extreme avalanche danger, which then makes really, like, um, mellow terrain really, you know, at that point you don't need much to kill someone. Sounds like a resort day on those days. Definite resort day. <laughs> we have to get you up there to the resort. Oh, definitely. Um, I Like I said, you know. You I, won't believe these greens. They, you're going to rip them. And the, um, the, I think they call them snow ghosts, the trees that are all covered in white. Oh man, I took yeah. Those are really unique. Those are that's like some of the only like it definitely in North America. You guys don't get those down here. We don't get. I mean, it, we'll get a little bit of it, but um. I have a few good pictures I need to send you then with your yeah. board right in front of it, just a massive, because uh, those are all at the top of the mountain. Yeah, those are beautiful. Yeah, they're not fun when you hit them. No. Tomahawking. They not look all done. soft and fluffy, <laughs> but um, it's really just a metal pole sitting there. I don't know how many videos I have of just white, blue, white, blue, white, blue. <laughs> and then you hear, because <laughs> my kids just roll up and I'm sitting there. I mean, I'm laughing too because, right. like I said, I just say drunk driver and go with it. And once I go over once, I don't know what's up and right. down. But, yeah, that's that's the journey I've been on. Uh, dude, thank you for your time, man. It was so cool to see that video, start up, watching you from a distance on social media, the generosity to invite me here and sit down and talk about this stuff. I can't thank you enough, man. Well, um, thanks for having me and thanks for your service. Yeah, it was my pleasure. Most, most of it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cheers. Well, that's it for today. Ladies and gentlemen, I guess that's it for this week. What is new? Uh, hmm. Last week we launched free range American. That is probably what is the newest, uh, aspect of my life. And, Go to freerangeamerican.us and check it out for yourself. It is a brand that celebrates the freedoms we are so incredibly fortunate and privileged and lucky to have. 
I dislike people who talk about being free, but don't exercise it at all. Not going to necessarily judge them, but I really wish that it was the exact opposite. They exercise their freedom and they talked about it a little bit less. The mission statement for the brand is simple. Do awesome shit. That's it. You can do that in the water. Whatever form the water may take. Maybe it falls from the sky in little flakes. Maybe you're surfing one foot waves or 50 foot waves, but you're out there, you're pushing the limits. Maybe you're climbing rocks. Maybe you're jumping off the rocks. Maybe you're an athlete, regardless of what kind you are. Maybe you're on a motorbike. Maybe you play hockey, lacrosse, fill in the blank. Any ball, bat, or stick sport, come get some. Maybe Maybe you don't do any of those things, but you like, just like being outside, you like hiking, you like camping. You know what? Everybody is welcome and invited to hop on board this brand because the best thing about the brand is it's not about me and it's not about Dudley. It is about the people who agree with the mission statement of do awesome shit and the statement that freedom is valueless and meaningless unless you use it. So check it out. Free Range American dot us dot com didn't really make sense for that particular domain name and i think let me see this comes out on monday by the end of this week if you're listening to this on the release day or the release week by friday the women's apparel should be landing and let's be honest no guy is out there doing awesome shit without the support of a pretty killer woman as well unless you're like creepy down by the river in a van by yourself and if you're that guy, uh, don't be that guy. Also, please don't buy a shirt. And that's all I have for this week. Thank you for the support. Thanks for the emails. Uh, with the Free Range America thing, before I forget, we are looking at doing a coast-to-coast -to -coast tour sometime next year. I have no idea when it's going to be, but we want to hit military bases, essentially starting in San Diego. I know one destination point will be Fort Bragg, which is where Dudley was born, and then anywhere along the way as well. So I've had a bunch of people reach out, but please continue to do so. I'm going to start getting back and actually throwing some pins on the board to see if we can put a skeleton to this thing. And that is it.